Really want to thank you all for turning out tonight. You're really in for a treat. Um, as Emily said, my name is Cam Moeller, and I'm actually an inactive general member right now just because I've been doing a significant administrative role at Stanford where I work. Um, but I've been coming to the Aspen Center for Physics for, I was figuring out this morning, I think um, 27 years. And I'm one of several generations of physicists that have been very strongly influenced by the programs here. I um, really appreciate you all turning out for our free physics lecture, which is sponsored by the Nick and Maggie D. Wolf Foundation. It's been supporting lectures in Aspen for over 30 winters. And their generosity, plus the generosity of every lecturer, every lecturer who are volunteers, makes it possible to share the new research that's moving the frontiers of science forward. Um, during the summer, we have lengthy workshops here, and during the winter, we have conferences where up to 110 physicists spend a really intense week, um, we share our latest research and get feedback, and we generate new ideas. We have talks, which are sort of semi-formal talks, but they get interrupted a whole bunch. I don't know how many of you have seen Oppenheimer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's that, <laughs> that really lively discussion. It's just like that, except there isn't only one person who's the Oppenheimer. There's sort of there's sort of a number of Oppenheimer types. Um, lots of lots of exchanges and going back and forth, even what's during what's supposed to be the formal talks. In that vein, I'd like to ask the physicists in the audience. We've had a very active, lively time in this room for the last three days, but tonight, please hold your questions, especially your technical questions, until the end of the talk. Um, and then, of course, we also spend time on the lifts, on the trails, on snowshoes and coffee shops, also discussing physics more generally. The conference this week is the Conference on Disorder and Quantum Phases of Matter. Um, I sometimes feel like I've spent my whole career discovering disorder where I hoped I wouldn't find it. <laughs> and realizing all of the many ways that disorder, of course, sometimes it's a bug, but realizing also the many ways that disorder can often be a feature, much like life. But when you're when you're talking about this talk afterwards, if you just remember that it's like there's all kinds of unexpected twists and turns in our daily lives, there also are all kinds of unexpected sources of disorder and surprises in the quantum world and quantum materials. I think that's for me a huge takeaway from this week. Um, I'm really happy though to have been here because honestly, I really want to give that organizers a huge shout out for their wisdom. In the 30 years since I first started studying condensed matter physics as a PhD student, this is the first time I've ever been at a conference that had the uh, wisdom to really focus on disorder and the role of disorder in quantum materials. It's been a really fun week. Um, I just I have so many great memories of Aspen. I really wish that I could invite all of you to come to all of our physics conversations. And I mean, I just to share a little with you what it feels like from my perspective, one of my really significant professional talks. The podium was over there and I was standing there and the chair of the MIT physics department was sitting right there where you're sitting in the white shirt. <laughs> Just pretend like you're the chair of the MIT physics department um, evaluating someone who might become a candidate for a faculty job. It's really, it's just very exciting here. And as my kids grew up, my my kids came and sort of they played in the streams and just ran around like feral children while I did physics with the other physicists. Um, let me turn to our speaker. It's considered a great honor in the physics community to be selected to give a public lecture here at Aspen. Uh, the center and the members of the center only choose to invite people who are at the forefront of the field and no pressure, Erica, but who also will be, we are certain will be unusually good at explaining it. I've been in some of those selection meetings and there's lots of wonderful opportunity opportunities for who we could invite. And it's very much discussed who would be the best person to do it. It's just part an, an important way of how we as physicists thank you, Aspen community, for supporting the center uh, by your interest by your interest in our work. Um, so tonight we're fortunate to have Professor Erica Carlson as our speaker. Erica W. Carlson, PhD, is a professor of physics at Purdue University. He holds a BS in physics from the California Institute of Technology, as well as a PhD in physics from UCLA. She's a theoretical physicist who researches electronic phase transitions in quantum materials. In 2015, she was elected a fellow of the American Physical Society for theoretical insights into the critical role of electron nematicity, order, and noise in novel phases of strongly correlated electron systems and predicting unique characteristics. Will people know what all those words mean by the end of the evening? Maybe not all, <laughs> don't worry. She's been on the faculty of Purdue since 2003, 
She was recently named a 150th anniversary professor in recognition of her teaching excellence. Mm -hmm. I have to say that I and many other people here in this room knew Erica before she was a professor much earlier in her career. And it was already obvious from the very beginning that she would be a fantastic teacher. So if you enjoy tonight's talk, tell your friends to come to other talks, but also check out Erica on the web. Um, her latest work, Popularizing Science, can be found at www.thequantumage.com. So Erica, thank you. Welcome, Erica. All right, thank you, Cam, for that excellent uh, introduction. And uh, it was a lot of fun to hear from Cam uh, what all she's enjoyed experiencing here at the Aspen Center. Uh, so I'll be telling you tonight about uh, creating new universes inside of quantum materials. And um, our research field of quantum materials, I think, hasn't been all that popularized uh, out, in, out in the wild. So I'm excited you're, you're here and you turned out for it. Um, and I'm excited that you saw the title and thought it was interesting because certainly uh, I think it's very interesting. I think it's completely fascinating. It's got a lot of incredible fundamental physics in it, a lot of incredible fundamental physics ideas, and there's also the tremendous potential to impact our world. And so I'm, I'm uh, excited to get to share that uh, with you tonight. Now, uh, this is a picture that I had fun creating on Dolly today. Um, I asked it to create something in the style of Van Gogh. Um, and uh, now here at first, I'm just showing you a monochromatic view of this, okay? There's not much color in this picture yet. It's just, just a monochromatic grayscale image. And so let's just think about what happens if I start to add a new color to this picture. Right now it's grayscale. I'm going to add a new color. And we get a little bit more vibrancy, it's a little bit more, perhaps a happier picture at this point. Um, not quite as expressive as it could be if you could add another color. So let's let's add, we've added the red hues, let's add uh, the yellow hues and see what this what this turns into now. It's better, right? It's better. And now now we're at the stage of uh, uh, what the uh, the ancient uh, cave paintings are in, in uh, Lascaux. They have the same kind of color set in them. At least those are the only pigments that have survived the 20,000 year trip to us. Um, so you could still convey quite a bit here, but you know, what more can you do if I give you the rest of the color palette, right? So this is like handing an artist like Van Gogh, um, a color palette that just has black and red and yellow in it. And when you have those, you can mix a few colors. You can mix gray, you can mix pink, you can mix orange. So you see several colors up here, even though there were only three pigments that I handed him. But what's it going to be like when I hand another pigment to this artist, right? So let's add, let's add into this mix the blue. So now I'm going to hand this artist the blue pigment. We'll see what kind of vibrancy comes out now. So now we were able to fill out the entire rainbow, right? And we see the vibrant reds, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, um, as well as some magenta and some white and black. It's all, it's all come together. So our field of quantum materials, excuse me, it's a little bit like adding these pigments in, okay? When when we discover new quantum materials, it's it's like we're adding new pigment to the color set that artists have to paint things, okay? Now, I do theoretical physics. What, what is somebody going to do with this new material that we either think of or that gets created by somebody? I don't know. Actually, that's kind of above my pay grade to say exactly what someone's going to do. But it is a um, it's a great joy to be thinking about how do we add to that color set, right? And then what will the artists create is up to them and up to their ingenuity and their inventiveness. And of course, the real analogy I mean is is the the, the engineers who take these great materials we produce and then make great new technologies for all of us. So, what are some of the you know pigments that have come out already in quantum materials? So. We have lots of different particles that come up inside of quantum materials. And, and so part of the, the fun of this field is like, um, is that inside of each quantum material, it's like a whole new universe. So, you know, out in the wild and in our universe, we have a certain set of particles. But when you go and study inside of a particular quantum material, we have access to new particles that you can't have outside of that material. And here's just some of them, okay? So holons and spinons and maronas and vortices and magnons and Dirac fermions and magnetic monopoles and anions and skermions and hedgehogs. And there are more. And we keep finding or creating new quantum materials. And so there will be more. So I think this is an extremely exciting aspect of being in this research field. 
And you know what's going to come, right? New quantum technologies um, could be several different things, but we expect there to be impact. There already is impact in a lot of areas, but we expect there to be impact in several different sectors of, of society and that you'll be using a lot of these new quantum technologies. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you about um, some quantum technologies that you already uh, already use. So what do we what do we mean by a quantum material? What makes it a quantum material? This is a um, kind of a fun party game to play with physicists in the field. I've been asking my colleagues this question for 10 years. What do we mean by quantum materials? And what do you mean by quantum materials? Because every, you know, the physicists will tell you that every material has quantum mechanics operating inside of it and has some quantum features in it. So what we mean by what we'll call a quantum material is we can take very tiny quantum properties. You know, usually quantum properties operate at very tiny length scales, like the length scale of an atom that sort of size. So how small is an atom? Um, if, if this is a meter, -ish, this is a meter ish, and I divide by 10 and then divide by 10 and then divide by 10 and divide by 10, 10 times, you get down to the size of an atom. It's very small. And that's where the quantum effects really become prominent. Quantum effects being things like the wave nature of a particle, particles are waves and waves are particles. And I'll tell you a little bit later about spin. Spin is a patently quantum mechanical phenomenon. So we're trying to take some of these quantum properties that are there and unlock their potential to use them uh, to, to create new, new technologies. And so with a quantum material, we've taken these quantum properties and we've brought them to the forefront. We can use them and where we can control them. So the universe we're given, right? This universe that we walk around in and, and have our tea in. Thanks for the tea tonight, by the way. Um, we have a certain set of particles that come to us in this universe like electrons, protons, neutrons, quarks, gluons, the Higgs boson, there are more, okay? There's a certain set that are just given to us in the natural universe. Again, inside of quantum materials, we can have these, these different ones, right? And we can have different particles. And, and you know, why is, why is that? Part of what's going on is that the, the inside of each of these quantum materials has a different um, quantum state it can be in. A quant we, we call it a... Um, it's it's in analogy to what gets called the quantum vacuum state. Has any has anybody not the physicist, but but he's not a physicist in the room. Have you heard of something called a quantum vacuum state? It's just whatever's going on when there aren't any particles around. Okay? So the universe has a particular quantum vacuum state. You want to find it? You go out into outer space. And you look in between the particles where there's nothing, and that's it's the quantum vacuum state. And then the particles that arise on top of that, okay, are, are things like electrons and protons and so forth. Um, inside of a quantum material, we get new quantum vacuum states. Now, in our case, they're happening in the context of a material. So there's already a lot of particles running around in there. What happens is that those particles inside create new phases of matter. That new phase of matter becomes like a new quantum vacuum state, a new quantum many body vacuum state, out of which fundamentally different particles can arise. And so that's that's part of the excitement. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So the, the base of this then is of different, the different phases of matter that can happen. So um, you've heard of phases of matter and phase transitions. So um, I'm sure you've heard of solid and liquid and gas. Um, can somebody who's, who's not a physicist in the room tell us some other phases of matter? Yeah. Plasma. Plasma. <laughs> okay, awesome. Adam, any any others? <clears throat> there, there are more. She didn't take them all. Yeah. Any, any, anybody want to shout some of those out? Right. Pardon? What? <laughs> it's fine with me if you Google stuff during this, this lecture. Totally fine. We're not, you're not being graded at all. So we, we have lots and lots of, of phases of matter uh, that go beyond um, what, we, what we just listed. So, um, you know, I was showing you before solid, liquid, and gas. Actually, the it's kind of a, a cute uh, animation there. Um, not animation, a graphic. Um, it's, it's a lovely uh, artist picture of water in its in its three phases, solid, liquid, and gas. But there's there's many more. So you mentioned um, plasma and Bose-Einstein continents. So, okay, well done. Those are on my slide somewhere here. Um, so we have plasma, we have Bose-Einstein condensate. Um, does, any, does anybody have a laptop? Anybody? I mean, you don't have to have it here, but just somewhere in your possession, somewhere at home, you have a laptop. It has an LCD screen. LCD stands for liquid crystal display. And something that's a liquid crystal 
is somewhere, <clears throat> excuse me, is somewhere between liquid and crystal. It's actually a new, new phase of the matter. So liquid crystals, I've, I've put in a different box here because there are all sorts of wild things that can happen when you have something that can be liquid in one direction and crystal in another, for example. Oh, you had another one to add. I was going to ask, what is snow? Is it a crystal? Snow is a crystal. Yes, it's it's this, it's kind of funny, huh? It's it's this phase of water. That's a great question since we're in Aspen. I'm so glad you asked what is snow. I will try not to get distracted and go off for five minutes on what is snow. But it is it is the solid phase, but it's a very special morphology of the solid phase, right? Where it grows these beautiful crystals. And the, the lovely thing about that is the shape. What's the symmetry of a snowflake? You guys remember how many arms is a snowflake supposed to have? Six. six, six. It's okay. You can debate later. It's supposed to have six. So they have, they have six arms most of the time. It depends if it's cold, you get needle-like ones, right? I'm sure that happens sometimes here, but those structures are a clue to the microscopic configuration. It's a clue to how the water atoms are, um, sorry, how the water molecules are hooking up to each other. So when you see the shape of that, it's a, it's a man. I hope you do this even now. I, you guys live in Aspen, but I hope when it snows, you look at some of the snowflakes because they're gorgeous, right? Yeah. And appreciate it. And when you see that shape, you're seeing a macroscopic macro meaning large, a macroscopic manifestation of the underlying quantum physics that told those water molecules how to join up and make the crystal. So it's it's awesome, isn't it? So every time you see a snowflake, you're seeing you're seeing some quantum right there. I'm glad you asked that. Good question for Aspen. So lots of different phases of matter. Okay, what I'm telling you right now is phases of matter of atoms and molecules. I put glass and amorphous solids in a box, and people have long debates and and um, heated debates about exactly whether they're a separate phase. They might just be out of equilibrium. I think they're probably just out of equilibrium, but. I don't want to get in trouble. Um, and then you mentioned Bose-Einstein condensate. Superfluids are very similar. This is something crazy that a superfluid can do called the fountain effect. But I don't need you to understand what these phases are. I'm trying to simply make the point that we've got a lot of them. We've got more than solid liquid gas, more than you were taught in elementary school. We've got, we've got more. And we've got even more, okay? And some of these you've you've seen and didn't really realize you were holding a different phase of matter in your hand. So foams, I put foams here. This is my favorite foam, bread. This is my, my daughter's favorite foam, uh, bath time. Um, we eat lots of suspensions uh, and granular, some granular matter. We only eat some granular matter. Uh, and uh, then there's messier stuff like gels. <laughs> yeah, I got to tell you, um, I, I'm a big fan of hand gel. And I've been carrying this since before the pandemic, so tells you a little bit about me. Um, and then there's other gels um, and uh, cross-link polymers that we use. Now, it turns out, and, and this is where we get to quantum materials. We're, get, we're getting closer, okay? Um, electrons inside of materials have their own phases of matter and phase transitions. And that's really exciting to me. So here are just some of those electronic phases of matter. This is basically about what are the electrons doing inside that material? So here I've put metals, okay? So, you know, you use metals. Anytime you have a wire to charge your phone or to charge your laptop, inside of that is some copper, it's a metal. And the key, the key here is that electrons flow inside of a metal. That's what we use them for. We use them to carry electricity. Um, if you were to look, you know, inside, say, um, a, a hunk of wood or something like that, it, the electrons don't flow. They're much more solid-like in that, in that material. So there's an actual phase transition between a, a, a material that's, liquid electrons flowing through it, a metal, versus one that's an insulator, doesn't have electrons that flow in it. But semiconductors and band insulators together, um, because uh, the only difference is the temperature scale, but semiconductors, of course, we've gotten a lot of mileage out of, but they're a particular phase of what the electrons are doing inside the solid. Uh, there's all sorts of magnets. Does anybody have a magnet? You don't have to have it with you, but somewhere, somewhere in your life, you have a magnet, okay? And uh, magnets are when the little magnetic moments inside the material line up, um, they can also anti-align and do crazy things. So this is just to tell you there's lots and lots of magnetic phases beyond the ones you've heard of. Um, there's things called superconductors where the electrons use the body system to, to pair up. And then they can do very special things, very much like that, that Bose-Einstein condensate you mentioned. And so something very similar to that gives them new properties. Those guys can carry electricity without costing any energy at all, which is, which is lovely. Um, there are also uh, quantum Hall phases. This happens when you stick electrons inside of a semiconductor sandwich. And um, I'll tell you a little, a little bit about some of those. Well, as soon as you get to this box right here, just if you were trying to keep track of how many phases I had counted, we just got to infinity. 
theoretically speaking, we've never measured it, but theoretically speaking, what, what you do here is you take a, um, an interface between two semiconductors, electrons get trapped there, you put a magnetic field perpendicular to that. And then as a function of the magnetic field strength, you enter new phases of the electrons can do. And as uh, theoretically speaking, there's an infinite cascade there. And then one of my favorite phases that electrons can do inside of solids is an electronic liquid crystal phase. So in this type of, of case, the electrons might flow in one direction like liquid, but they might remain rigid like a solid in the other direction. They're very strange and exotic phases of matter. So there's lots of these things. And the key is that every time there's a new electronic phase of matter, that's like a new quantum many body vacuum state, out of which then new particles can arise inside of that material. So that's part of the fun here is when you see this, this is what I mean by the new universe is inside of materials. Um, each one is, is like its own new universe in that it has its own particles that go with it. Like I was saying that it goes back to the quantum vacuum state, um, or in, in the case of, of a solid, we're talking about a quantum many body vacuum state, and we can get new particles on top of that. And inside of quantum materials, lots of different. I've, I've only shown you a, a few here, um, but but many, many different ones. Um, so let me tell you about um, a couple of quantum materials. I'll go in depth to a couple of them tonight. And I'm going to start with one that I hope is already familiar to you. So quantum material number one that we'll discuss is magnets, right? And you have a magnet somewhere in your life. So you either have a magnet holding up a note on your refrigerator or holding up a note somewhere else on your life in, in your life. Um, actually, you're all listening to my voice right now through speakers, and the speakers use magnets to convert the electrical signal back into sound signal. Uh, so you can you can hear it. So we're all very fond of magnets. We use them a lot. And I really, really hope that as a kid or as an adult, as the case may be, I really hope that you have played with magnets. Um, and uh, I actually, of course, keep some on my desk because I'm a physicist and it's my job to play with magnets, right? So, so this, it turns out, I'm, is, is a quantum material. Why is that? <laughs> so what I said by a quantum material, we want to take the quantum properties and bring them to the forefront, to the macroscopic, the large level of the material as a whole, where we can use them and where we can control them. So why does this guy get called a quantum material? This, this is arguably would, would be the first one that we harnessed for technological purposes, right? When we dug rocks out of the ground and figured out that some of them were lodestones and we could use them to make a compass for navigation. So we've harnessed this one ages ago. Um, the, the key is that we have theorem, hardcore theorem in classical physics. When we say classical, it means we're not going to take into account any quantum effects. So there are no quantum effects present, and you're just doing classical physics, we have a hardcore theorem that says magnets cannot exist. None of them. So anytime you've held a magnet, you are holding a manifest violation of classical physics that requires quantum physics in order even to exist. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so what is going on inside uh, that, that we're going to pull out is the... Um, is the magnetic moments that are happening at a very tiny scale inside of these uh, materials. So inside of a material, it's going to turn out to be the electrons that carry the magnetic moments for us. So if I think about, well, how, how can an electron make a magnetic moment happen? So we use electrons to carry current, right? So if I were to give you a loop of wire and you could run that, run it in a loop, and then you turned the electricity on, and now electricity started flowing. You probably learned in high school physics, or you've used somewhere in your life. If you didn't get to take it, I'm telling you now. Um, when you run current in a loop, it actually makes a magnetic field. That's called an electromagnet. So if you have the kind of magnet that has a switch you can turn on or off, it's an electromagnet. You're using that principle. And so inside of, of um, magnets, um, electrons are doing this kind of motion at the atomic scale. So you know, imagine the the nucleus of an atom, and then an electron is near that atom and is just kind of going around in a little loop. Okay, so when it goes around in a little loop like that again and again and again, that's a current loop. It makes a little nanoscale electromagnet, and that contributes to the magnetism that you see in a magnet that you hold in your hands. There's another piece of the puzzle, which is that electrons have another way to create a magnetic field. 
And this one is weird. And so for this, um, I asked the organizers to give me a ball. So here's a ball. And so I'm going to give you an analogy for electron spin. And it's going to help you start thinking about electron spin. And then I'll tell you where the analogy is wrong. Okay. So just hold, hold your breath because there's going to be some good things and some bad things in this analogy. But let's pretend the electron were a ball. Okay. So the motion I just told you about was the electron going around an atom. So let's say I'm the atomic uh, nucleus and then that electron's going around that made part of the magnetism, right? The electron can do this other thing. It can spin. Oh, here's why I'm not very skilled at this. All right. But the electron can spin on its axis. Okay. Now, if this is a big charged ball, this, this is not, this is not a charged ball, but if this were charged like an electron and full of charge throughout its, its volume and I spun it, it also makes a little electromagnet, right? That's also going to produce a little magnetic moment, a little magnetic field associated with it, okay? So electrons do this. They are somehow spinning. And when we talk about electron spin, that's what we mean. This little electron has with it a magnetic moment associated with it. So here's where my analogy breaks down. As far as we can tell, the size of an electron is, is zero. We've looked for a radius and we can't find it, okay? Now, do we ever really measure zero in science? You measure to our detection threshold, okay? So as far as we can tell, there's no radius, all right? But, you know, maybe someday we'll find one. But so far, as far as we can tell, it may as well be a point particle. So that's one problem with this analogy. Another problem is that so this ball can spin at any speed, right? This ball can stop spinning. It can spin slow. It can spin fast. It can spin in any direction. I can spin around this axis. Electrons are different in that with an electron, if it's spinning, so I'm going to put the ball down. You just have to imagine for me electrons. So if I have an electron and I measure its spin, I first need to choose an axis. So I choose, well, I'm going to see if it's spinning around this axis and I'll just measure it. If I do that, I choose an axis myself, I find that that electron is always spinning around that axis every single time. And I find that it's either spinning clockwise or counterclockwise. And it's always spinning by the exact same amount. This thing can't slow down and it can't go any faster. It's always spinning. So let's say I did that. I took an electron, I measured it along that axis. It's got this magnetic moment. It's, it's spinning either this, this way or that way, but it's always spinning by the same amount. Now I'm going to check another axis, right? So this was one axis. This was the vertical axis. I'll check a horizontal axis. When I immediately check a horizontal axis, I find that that electron is spinning around that axis now. And it's spinning at the same amount. It can't slow down. It can't speed up. But it's always spinning, either clockwise or counterclockwise, around any axis I try, no matter how fast I try. So very, very weird, very strange stuff, very, very quantum. Okay, so there's two ways in which electrons contribute to magnetism in your magnets. One is that orbital motion, we call it, around the nucleus. The other is this intrinsic angular momentum, intrinsic magnetic moment that we call spin. And so the magic happens then when these guys align. So at high temperatures, so you can imagine what I've done here is yellow is meant to represent um, the magnet on your refrigerator, the thing you can hold in your hand. The little teeny tiny bar magnets here where they're north and south are a cartoon meant to, meant to tell you, well, what's the net magnetic moment around any given atom? So around any given atom, you'll have some net magnetic moment due to how the electron moves around it and then how the electron is spinning. The combination of that together gives you a little nanoscale magnet um, around each, each atom. However, at high temperatures, those little things are disordered. So at high temperatures, there's a lot of jiggling in the material. The things get wiggled around and jiggled and things like that. And so at high temperature, it's actually not um, magnetic. And it turns out that as you lower the temperature, then you will find the, the magnetism. Or another way to look at it, another way to look at it is that, let's take your refrigerator magnet, okay, and, and heat it up. So if you take that refrigerator magnet and think of heating it up, if you heat it up enough, you're definitely going to find a phase transition, right? So if you heat it up enough, you will turn it into a puddle of lava for sure. And that would be a phase transition from solid to liquid, right? But way before that temperature, if you heat it up, not quite that much, still hot, but not quite that much, um, right around where the material starts glowing red, okay? It'll suddenly lose its magnetism. Boom, it's not a magnet anymore. It's still a solid, it's not a magnet. And what happened is it's a phase transition of the electrons. The electrons changed what they were doing. And what they change is that in the high temperature phase, 
those little electronic magnets are pointing every which direction just due to thermal excitations. What is temperature due to a material? It jiggles everything. Imagine he's not standing still, but everything's just kind of wiggling, jiggling, wiggling, jiggling. Okay. And so all that shaking around just makes these things point in all different direction. The low temperature state in the low temperature phase, right? There's an actual phase transition from not magnetized to magnetized. And all those little nanoscale magnets line up, and that's what gives you the permanent magnet that you can then use to hold a note on your refrigerator. So um, that's our, um, our first quantum material. Now, why do they line up? Okay, so you might ask the question, well, what, what made them line up in the first place? How does one over here know what the other's doing and how should they, should they talk to each other? It turns out it's, due to, it's always due to three things. Exact proportion is different in, in different materials and exactly which one wins is different in different materials. It's, it's actually quite complicated. Um, but to summarize a very complicated story, that's actually not entirely understood in every material, to be honest. Um, to summarize a complicated story, there's, there's three main effects going on that, that tell a material whether it should be ferromagnet at low temperature or not. Um, and that's the Coulomb repulsion, okay? What is that? Uh, that is the fact that like charges repel. Um, you've probably heard that, that opposite charges attract and like charges repel. So electrons repel each other. That's an important piece of the physics. They don't want to be too close to each other. They want to stay a little bit apart. Another piece of the puzzle is that um, the quantum effects, particles are waves and waves are particles. And so these electrons, rather than thinking of them as little point particles hanging around, another way you can think of them as the little standing waves, they're actually waving. There's a wave associated with each electron. And so they kind of make these little wave shapes and those waves can have different forms to them, different shapes. And so those different shapes that the electron waves take matter. And then there's this special thing called the Pauli exclusion principle, which is a long phrase that basically means that two electrons cannot do the exact same thing at the same time. It's a hard, fast quantum rule. Okay, so electrons can't do exactly the same thing at the same time. And so um, uh, this actually turns out to be why I can't push my hands through each other and why I stand on the floor rather than fall through it. It's because it, because two electrons can't do the same thing at, at the same time. That's why matter that you can hold in your hands can't occupy the same space at the same time. If it did, the electrons would be doing the same thing at the same time. and. They can't. So this is part of the picture too, the fact that those electrons can't do the exact same thing. So that whole combination of things together gives you the interactions that then cause those little guys to line up. All right, quantum material number two is going to give us a very, very strange case. So this is the story of a totally different type of particle called an anion, um, and it's called anion because there can be quite a quite a few of them. They can almost do anything, which is why they kind of get called anions. Um, so it's a very special type of particle that has no counterpart out in the natural universe. Sometimes we have these new particles coming up inside of quantum materials, and we can say, well, they're a little bit like this other thing out in nature, or they're a little bit like this other thing out in nature. These guys are totally different. There's not even anything analogous. So in the universe that we have, okay, this universe, there, every particle that exists in this universe it can be categorized in, into two different categories. They're either fermions or they're bosons, okay? Every single particle, without exception. So the ones that are fermions, for example, are things like electrons that we've been talking about, quarks, muons, uh, neutrons, protons, these are fermions. They obey that the Pauli exclusion principle. They can't do the same thing at the same time, okay? And because, because all matter that you can touch and hold in your hand is composed of neutrons, protons, and electrons, that means you can't pass matter through itself, okay? There's another type of particle, though, which is bosons, right? And bosons can do the same thing at the same time. Um, and this is really weird. So um, photons are a great example. There's also gluons. A Higgs boson, as you may guess, being called a boson, is a boson, so... Give yourself uh, extra points for that if you, if you got that one. Uh, gravitons are also uh, bosons. So photons, an example of photons is my laser pointer right here. So it, the particles coming out of it are photons. So light is made up of, of photons. That's another example of something that we could describe as a wave or we could describe as particles. When we describe it as particles, we call them photons. Um, 
And a key aspect is that these, these bosons are very different fermions because they can do the same thing at the same time. Actually, that's what makes laser light so bright. That's why, it's, you know, it being so bright is why, why people like playing with them. And like, you know, if you have a cat, I'm sure you have several laser pointers on hand because your cats love them too. So what makes it so bright is that you're stuffing a bunch of photons all into the exact same quantum state at the same time. So that's what makes that laser light so intensely bright. So they're very different types of particles, all right? Um, now, now I'm going to tell you a little bit more about um, quantum aspects here. So every every particle has a wave associated with it, right? And so we can either be thinking about these things as, as little, little discrete objects, or we can think of that discrete object as having a wave associated with it. When I think of that, that wave, sometimes we call it the wave function, um, that wave does something very strange. If you take the particle and turn it around, or if you exchange one particle with, with another. So um, for example, if I have two fermions, let's just think of two electrons. We were thinking of them before. If I take two electrons and exchange them, it's a very different situation from if I did the same thing with the bosons. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about, uh, about that. Um, so uh, but let me, let me tell you how you're going to get weird, weird particles that are neither category. So inside of uh, semiconductor sandwiches actually is how you make it. So you need some semiconductor sandwiches, meaning I'm going to take two different semiconductors and have an interface between them. Right at that interface, get essentially a two-dimensional universe. I can trap some electrons and they're only allowed to move right along that interface. And an interface is a properly two-dimensional system. And then you, you, you also have to apply a, a magnetic field to get the magic to happen. But it's in that context then in these semiconductor sandwiches, you can get a third category of particle called anions. And you very strange things. So when you exchange two anions, it's nothing like, it, it, you can't categorize as either a fermion or um, a boson. So what, what do these semiconductor sandwiches look like? Here's an example of one of them. That's really complicated. You don't need to read all of that or understand it. I just want you to know these are big sandwiches. Not like my sandwich on the right that was created by Dolly Day. Um, I tried to get Dolly to make um, a single slice of ham, and it, it just couldn't do it. So this was our, our best. So I, you know, they got some feedback from me today. But you know, it's not a simple sandwich. This is much more like Pete the Cat's big lunch sandwich, where it may not be evident from the cover of the book. But if you read the book, as I have read several times with my daughter, um, this is Pete the Cat making a sandwich that has everything in it. So it's a very, very large and complicated sandwich, very much like this semiconductor sandwich. But the key being the interface between two materials is a place where you can trap electrons and give them a two-dimensional world where totally new physics can come about. Let me dig a little deeper into that. So I said there's these bosons and there's these fermions. And then inside of semiconductor sandwiches, you can make anions. Pretty cool. So bosons have this kind of property. Let me take two bosons. I'm, I've cleverly named them, number one and number two, kind of like Dr. Seuss, right? Thing one and thing two. So these are two bosons. And when they exchange places, when you switch these two bosons, <clears throat> nothing happens, nothing whatsoever. That's why my diagrams look very similar, other than the fact that the two and the one were switched. Um, there's a, there's a key piece you need to know here, which is that the wave that's associated with any particle in quantum mechanics has something associated with it called a, a phase. And here's, here's where I have to bust out my slinky. It's, it's either math or a slinky at this point, and I, I know which one we should do in this context. So um, if you're a physicist, right, you never, never travel without a slinky. I was delighted I got this thing through um, uh, security, right? So, because it's not a threat. Who's threatened by a slinky? Okay, so... I'm going to show you a type of wave on the slinky, and there's great analogies between the wave on the slinky and the waves, the quantum waves that particles have. So one thing I can do with the slinky is put some waves on it. So here I've got a wave. You see that it's nice, regular, repeatable behavior. And that's what waves do. They undulate in some way. They wave. This guy's waving, okay? And that's one type of wave. I can put a different type of wave on it. So now here it's doing something different. It's still waving, right? Everyone would agree I've got, got waves on here. We could get fancier here and we could put even higher frequency waves on here and so forth. But if you look at this wave from the side now, okay? if you look at it from the side, you see how the wave I've put on here is going around in a circle, right? 
I want to map that circle to the color wheel, which is what I've done up there. A physicist would call it a phase because we can describe it by an angle. So at any particular time, I can talk about the angle at which this thing is. You could also think of it as hands on a clock, right? Something that goes around. I like to think of it as the color wheel because it gives me nice visualizations <laughs> of these things. Um, so there's my color wheel, okay? That's going to tell us if I have a quantum wave, where is it in its undulation? Okay, and so that color just tells me where is it in its undulation. Um, let's just call that a phase, all right? So when I take two bosons and I exchange them, I don't think whatsoever happened to the to the overall wave function. So what I'm going to do here is I'm I want a, a wave that describes both of those bosons at the same time. It's called two particle uh, two particle wave function. And so exchange those bosons, nothing happened. It, it's the same wave function. You can't even tell the difference. And so that's why I color both of these red. Undulation is at the same spot. I do this with fermions, something strange happens, okay? So I took two fermions. And because of the weird stuff going on with fermions, when I exchange two fermions, even though you can't, you know, if I give you two electrons, you couldn't tell the difference between them. They're, they're identical particles. You can't carve your name in an electron. Every single electron is just like every other electron. So, so if I had two electrons and you closed your eyes and I switched them, you would have a hard time telling me which was which. But if you had some way to detect that phase of the wave, you would know I switched them. Because what happens here is that it goes um, halfway around that color wheel. So if it started over here in the red, it goes halfway around into the cyan. Really strange. And then you might imagine if I switch them again, right? And you're going to see why I want to switch them again in, in a second. Um, if I switch them again, then I get halfway around the color wheel again. So for the, so for the bosons, I can switch them once and get back to the same state. The fermions, I have to switch them twice. Just part of how they behave. And so that's part of, if you want it, if somebody gave you a, a particle and you didn't know what it was, this is one of the things you can do to it. You can switch its position and see what the phase of the wave does. And that'll tell you how many times do I have to switch it to get it back to its same original state. I just need to switch it once, it's a boson. If I have to switch it twice, it's a fermion. So you may be seeing where this is heading. Is these are just fermions and bosons. And I told you there's this other weird particle called an anion can kind of do anything. Um, so when I switch them twice, we just to give you the terminology here, we call it a braid. Okay? Um, so switching them twice is, is gets called a braid, a braid. And in this case, I switched the bosons twice, I got back the same state. I switched the fermions twice, I get back the same state. So if I, I braid it completely, okay, then there's no difference. You can't tell any difference. And that's the way all particles in this universe act. We all do this, every single one of them. Okay. But inside of these semiconductor sandwiches, strange things happen. And so inside of these semiconductor sandwiches, um, the collective many body quantum vacuum state that happens there allows strange new particles to happen. Now they're emergent particles. You can't take that particle out and hand it to you. It's stuck inside of the semiconductor sandwich. It's only there, but it's a localized disturbance that we can track. And then we call that a, a particle. And so the these anions can do anything when you do this kind of experiment. So when I switch the positions of two anions, it can go any amount around the color wheel, which is why they get called anions. So here I've got one starting here and going one twelfth of the way around the color wheel. Switch it again. And remember, if I switch the particles twice, that's what's called a braid. I wind them around completely. That gets called a braid. Um, so here, then it went one sixth of the way around the color wheel. So it started here, then went there, then it went there. Right there, that's the thing that tells you it's not a boson and it's not a fermion. And it's, it's, it's kind of otherworldly. It's this particle that you know, can't exist out in the wild, but it can exist inside of these quantum materials. If you switch it enough times, eventually it will go all the way around the color wheel, right? This one's just doing it slowly. Eventually, 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 I wind it around enough times, I braid it enough times, and I'll get back around the color wheel. Very strange. So how would you detect this if you had it? Let's say you had a semiconductor sandwich. You wanted to detect this. Here's what you would do. You would put your anions on a highway. Okay? So this is a freeway. This is the anion freeway here. And this is an exit. So I'm going to have some situation where I can corral the anions. And I'm going to send them down this freeway. Here's an exit. They're going to take the exit, go around. It's a very boring exit. And they come back and they get back on. The key is... If there was another anion inside that, that little exit loop here, so if there's this other anion in there, then this act of the one particle number one, right, they're all 
cleverly named thing one and thing two. So if thing one wraps all the way around that anion, that is the same as a braid. It's the exact same operation as if I, right, if I switch them once and then switch them twice, one, one run around the other. So this does the same thing, this braids. So this guy that comes in, if it takes the exit and goes all the way around, it braided itself around article number two. And then it can merge back onto the freeway. Now here's the cool thing. Um, being a quantum particle, this anion has a wave associated with it, right? If you think in terms of a particle, so at this point, I want you to think in terms of a wave. Otherwise, the next part is not going to make sense. It's going to blow your mind either way. So particles are waves and waves are particles in quantum physics. So this anion has a wave and the wave can do whatever it wants. The wave can go straight down the freeway, and ignore the exit, or the wave can take the exit and go around. Or the wave can split up and do both at the same time. Well, why not? It's a wave, right? It'll just wiggle along down the freeway. Part of it, part of its wave will wiggle along down the freeway. Part of its wave will take that exit and come back around. So what they did in the experiment was they tuned the exit to be just the right kind of exit. But it basically would split the wave 50-50. Half went forward and half went around the exit. But the key there is that waves, when they kind of split like that and then come crashing back together, Special things can happen called interference. Okay? So you, you can get constructive interference. Constructive interference is if your waves come back together and they're at the same point. Then they add, you get more signal. If you've ever done a cannonball in a pool, maybe not this time of year, um, but if you've done a cannonball in a pool and then watch that wave go around the edge, and then what does it do when it meets in the shallow end? It like splashes up, right? That's constructive interference. Destructive interference is if these two waves come and they meet exactly opposite, one is high and one is low, then they actually just cancel each other out and there's nothing left. Now, you might not have seen that so easily, but you have definitely used it. Does anybody have noise canceling earbuds, noise canceling headphones? Noise canceling headphones work this way. They listen to the ambient noise and then that little speaker puts out exactly the same noise, what we call the opposite phase. If it's going high, the, the speaker makes it low. So those two waves together cancel out and that's how noise cancellation happens. So you've used this principle. And so isn't it awesome? <laughs> now it's, yeah. well, the next time you know, say, yeah. So the next time that you use your noise canceling headphones, I want you to put them on and tell somebody in your vicinity, total destructive interference. Yeah. That's because that's what it is. It's total destructive interference. So in this case, we're going to get partial interference because they're anions. Okay. So the anion wave comes in, splits, comes back, and basically, depending on whether that wave came up constructively, destructively, or part way, that modulates your signal. It, now, the number of anions that come out depend on that. And so you can tell by how, comparing how many anions you put in and then how many come out, you know, um, you know then what the, the phase of that guy is when it goes around and does the braid. And so this is the experiment that was done that actually showed you have um, anions. So um, I've been told I'm out of time. So I'm going to just skip ahead a little bit. And just, I want us to think though about, um, I want us to think though about what, what this means for having, you know, what does this mean for having new kinds of, of materials like this? You know, we've named the great ages of humanity by the dominant technological material, right? So back in the stone age, we had pretty primitive tools that were pretty good you know, we got better, we got into, um, you know, the iron age, that was better. You can make better weapons. Okay. Better, better implements for farming as well. Okay. And then we got into the bronze age. You can make even better stuff. Okay. We're in the information age right now. The information age is really the silicon age, right? Dominant material that technology is, is silicon. Um, and so we're, we're now entering basically quantum age. Okay. We're entering the quantum age where quantum materials are going to give us new technologies on par with the Silicon Revolution, on par with you know the Stone Age to the Bronze Age Revolution, I, I hope. Um, what exactly we're going to get out of it, you know, who's to say, right? How could you possibly predict when you gave Van Gogh a new pigment, pigment what he was going to paint next? It's up to his creativity and inventiveness. And that's where we are with, with quantum materials. It's up to the inventiveness of the engineers to take these great new pigments we give them and paint a bright new future for us. I'll end there. Thanks for your time.
unless the physicists to hold back from questions and invite members of the public to ask uh, the first questions to Dr. Carlson. Yes. Yeah. Don't be shy. I know you've got questions, like a million of them. Yeah. You describe it as a quantum material, which seems like kind of an interesting word because it's not, you know, I think of material as a different kind of fabric or leather or something that is more than a single interaction. So why why do you call them materials when really they're just these um, very, you know, why the choice? Why do I, why do I call it a material? Yeah. Oh, um yeah, I didn't get to invent the term. Um, so, uh, but but uh, but we'll, you know what we mean. I mean, we basically mean the same thing you mean. I mean, you when you know when you hear the word material, you think of all well, different stuff you can touch, right? We basically mean things you can touch. Basically, if you know if you can hold it in your hand, um, it, it's it's a material, right? You know, so you know leather counts. Um, you know, fabrics count. Cotton counts. Paper counts. Right, you know this this object here has several different materials that make it up. So I, I don't mean just the soft stuff. I guess that's what I should say. We use that word material more broadly, perhaps, than you're used to, to include not just soft stuff but hard stuff. Does that help? No, but the, oh, sucks. <laughs> I guess we get more of the repeatability that you know. Okay, whatever I look at it at this moment, nylon is nylon, or leather is leather, and uh -huh. these are all repeatable in a oh, sense. Of yeah. But on a scale more than this particular incident. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, um, and so you know, the way the way we think about what defines a material is what are the atoms inside of it, okay, and how are those atoms connected up, right? So, um, you know, so what makes um, uh, oh, I forgot to mention a quantum material that you have at home, which is a pencil, okay? Because in the pencil you have the pencil lead is not lead; it's it's made of carbon. And it's uh, it's graphite. But when you draw with it, you you get the little the little sheets of the graphite come apart. And if you're lucky, you'll get a single sheet somewhere, and that's graphene, which is an atomically thin layer of carbon. Um, so that's a material that's different from wood. It's also it's also different from diamond, right? Diamond's also made of carbon. Um, so the, they're both made of carbon. Very different, right? You would you would like propose to somebody with a pencil. <laughs> I hope. Um, I hope. So anyway, um, both carbon, but call them different materials because of how carbons are hooked up. So so for us, it depends on what, the, what are the atoms in there and how they're hooked up. Does that kind of help define what a material is? Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay, great. Oh, and by the way, it's being quantum material that I'm sure you already have pencils. We have a lot of these. And so you you can pick up uh, this quantum material on your way out. It'll be out just, just, just beyond the doors, okay? Yeah, you already got one. Good for you. You're like on the ball. Okay. All right. Awesome. Yeah. Sure. You know, you say stuff we can touch. And I'm curious because you talk about these particles, like when you hmm. hand somebody and that blows my I don't know. Okay. No, that's a great question. That's a great question. So the, the question is, I think, um, why did I say stuff you can touch when ultimately I'm talking about particles that are too small? So the material itself is something you can touch. That's what I mean. So if I'm calling something a material at all, it's something you can touch. So you're right. An atom is too small. We don't get to call it a material. It's just an atom, right? Um, a star is too big. I don't talk about that as a material, but if, if I can hold it in my hands in some fashion, then I call that a material. Now I call it a quantum material. If we can, if those quantum properties that are low, typically locked deep at the atomic state, if those have been brought to the forefront, how would they affect the macroscopic properties of the material in, in patently quantum mechanical ways? Sort of like a snow crystal. Yes, yeah, yeah. Sort of like a snow crystal is the question, yeah. These are great questions. We've got one, two, three. Yes. Well, you're saying like you can your sandwich. When you do it in the laboratory, how big is it? How big is the machine? Oh, okay, great question. Um, the question is, how big are these semiconductor sandwiches and how big is the machine. Okay, so I am, uh, I was not involved in this research, and I actually don't have a lab. I'm what's called a theoretical physicist. So I do math and I do computer simulations, and I try to predict what's supposed to happen inside of these materials. And then there are other scientists who are experimentalists, meaning they have equipment in a lab, and then they go in and they measure the way the world actually is. 
So this particular data I'm showing you um, is, is from uh, Mike Manfred's lab at Purdue University. Um, Jimmy Nakamura was, was the first author. Other groups have seen uh, similar stuff. <clears throat> and this is the particular semiconductor sandwich that they use. So here's their machine. And I'm sorry, there's not a human piece in there that tells you how big it is. It's a big machine. The big machine here, has lots of little tubes that are used to grow the material, basically. This is their special um, called molecular beam epitaxy, but it's a device for you know, shooting atoms in very slowly and in a controlled manner to grow exactly what you want. So they grew this thing very slowly, um, layer by atom, atom, atomic layer by atomic layer. So the thing itself is small, and I don't have a length scale. Oh, there's one for you. 200 nanometers in the, in the um, you look at this part right here. This is that freeway I was talking about. So here, their freeway is oriented a little bit different from my freeway. So um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, they've got things, well, it's just not, I can't quite see the arrows from my distance. So, but let's just say it's going this, the orientation I had. So these guys, the anions come up this way, they take the exit, come back around and then, and then the loop out again. And so this little bar here is 200 nanometers. A nanometer is about 10 atoms wide. And so this is about 2000 atoms wide right there. So that gives you a sense of the, the scale. So the device itself is tiny. And so you can imagine they have to you know, then have this thing mounted on something that's a little bit bigger. And then some, some poor grad student has to go in there and solder wires to the thing. I mean, <laughs> uh, it's difficult. It's hard to get a PhD. Uh. You, could, you could probably hold it with tweezers. Um, I am useless. So you could probably hold the chip with tweezers and it might be a millimeter or it might yeah. be a centimeter. Yeah. And then as Dr. Carlson is saying, there's these tiny little features fabricated onto it. Yeah. Um, next question. So in other areas of science, there's uh, AI being used, so like biology, synthetic biology and protein folding and whatnot. You haven't mentioned it in quantum materials. Like, how are you using AI? Okay, that's a great question. The question is, <clears throat> excuse me, the question is, are we using AI in quantum materials? And if so, how? We are absolutely using AI in quantum materials. Um, now, um, being a new tool and a kind of strange tool, um, it's, it took a little bit of time to ramp up in the community, but I would say it's it's becoming more and more standard. My group uses AI tools. So one of the AI tools that we use is, is machine learning. And so we, um, in order to identify um, what happens in certain quantum materials, um, we, we train some machine learning models on some of our computer simulations. So so for example, one exciting thing that happens in quantum materials, which, which actually... Um, is is one of the themes of this conference, this conference being disorder in quantum materials, um, is that when when you have a material that isn't perfect, I kind of talked about all these as though they're perfect. That's actually never the case. They're never perfect. But it's never such that I make this material and each atom is locked step registered next to the other atom all the way out to the edge of the material. There's always defects. And by defect, they just mean maybe an atom's out of place. Maybe one's missing. Maybe an extra one came in. And it turns out that even if I handed you a perfect crystal, all the atoms are lock solid in place. Um, and you just hey, held on to that thing for a couple of days. Thermodynamics forces defects into the thing. Defects meaning these, these little, little problems. And those defects are what we're calling disorder in this conference because they're uncontrolled. They, they don't you just kind of make a mess in the material. And so that's the disorder we mean. And so sometimes what that means, and this is kind of exciting, you, you could think about, well, if those, this, this, that little bit of disorder in there means things are a little bit different as they go from one space to another. Think about these being like little universes in there. Kind of get a multiverse in there, right? I mean, just different things can happen in different regions of the material, slightly different things. And so the, we've been using um, AI to train machine learning models on what those patterns can look like make predictions for experiments to the point now where we can take somebody's experimental image of strange patterns that come out of these things and put it into our thing. And it can tell us some information about it. Other groups are using it for, for other things, but we're absolutely using AI tools for sure. They're, they're helpful. Yeah. And, and they, I even actually, you know, I used some AI in the talk, right? Cause I, I was using Dolly to produce some of the images. I'm so sorry. We have a couple more questions on deck, but we're not going to be able to take them because we have to stop by 6.30 so people can make the bus. Um, I think you'll be here for a few more minutes. If you I'll stick around. There. Thank you so much for the talk. Thanks. Thanks for having me.